healthy for 17 years now, actually 10 years full-time doing nutrition consulting and that sort of thing. You can kind of read the bio there. Husband, father of four. Um, this is uh, my family, and you can tell the picture is a couple years old because that little guy in the middle is actually taller than me now. Uh, but they are the reason why I really got into nutrition in the first place was because I want to live long enough so I can see my great-great-grandchildren and uh, hopefully be romping around with them for a while. So that's, that's kind of how I got started. But um, before into the the kind of the meat of the presentation, I need to depress you slightly, and then I'll try and cheer you up later on with some with some good information. But start looking at some of the statistics. Um, we're not dying of diphtheria here in the U.S. typically. You know, we're not going to die of any kind of a virus typically in the U.S. Most of us, when we go, hopefully at the age of 120, are going to go from cardiovascular disease, cancer, stroke, respiratory, diabetes. And the common factor in a lot of these is much of these are uh, really lifestyle dominated. So, you know, you don't catch, um, you know, you don't, you're not catching cancer, you're not catching diabetes. These are not contagious diseases. They're degenerative. So your body is degenerating. And diabetes to me is one of the most, uh, it just aggravates me the most. It makes me angry <laughs> because with now, now let me separate the two. Type 1 diabetes is an ailment where your pancreas just sort of shuts down or does not produce enough insulin. And short of a miracle of God, you're pretty much going to be on insulin for the rest of your life, but you can manage your life uh, with type 1 diabetes through, uh, you know, even though you'll be insulin dependent. But type 2 diabetes is completely different. Uh, they should almost be called different diseases because they really are. Type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes, and they had to change the name to type 2 diabetes. And the reason was because adult onset diabetes was being developed in six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. Um, and that's the reason why they changed the name. It is a lifestyle. I'll get into a little bit of that. Um, the other thing I want to point out to people is most of the disease processes that, we, that are, we're dealing with, that we're fighting off in our bodies, are really at the cellular level. Now, human cell, if you look at those cell cultures on the left-hand side, that's what your cells should look like under a microscope if you're generally healthy. The middle is what your cells will look like if you've just eaten a meal in heavy, like fried hydrogenated oils. These are things like uh, even partially hydrogenated. So these would be things like uh, nuggets and fries, etc. And you can see that it's kind of clumped the cells together. And that's just oxidation. It's just, it's the same as, same process as rust would happen on a a fence, you know, a chain link fence or, or your bicycle chain if you left it out in the rain. That's that rusting process that's happening in our bodies. And all those diseases that I mentioned are basically rust on the inside of your body, just in different areas. Now, to give you a little bit of encouragement, the one on the right, the cell culture on the right, is when you've had a good diet and you, you know, let's say, you've, let's say you were naughty and you had those fries or you had those nuggets, but you had some other good foods with them or you took some actual antioxidants, some vitamins, some minerals with them, you got those oxidative, your oxidative defenses up, your body will protect itself. It'll start regenerating cells. It'll start, you know, it'll keep that oxidation away. So we're trying to, to, to really do here. Now, I'm, I promise I'm only going to show you maybe three slides because I'm a nerd. I used to be an engineer for 23 years, so I have to do some slides here. Um, and, there, but, and I promise after the three, I'll stop. <laughs> okay. uh, the first slide, this one shows basically what our blood sugar should be doing. Your body has an amazing ability to uh, manage blood sugar, to manage pH, to manage everything within a very, very narrow range, and it'll do so as best as it can with the given circumstances. So your body will have a good meal in the morning. Your blood sugar should rise slightly, but with a beautiful, nice green boundary, right? and then it should drop down gradually around snack time or meal time again, and then it should rise gradually again, just as, as we're showing. That's what should happen in your body. What typically does happen, though, if you look at the next slide here, is we by use by by eating, let's say, a bill and orange juice for breakfast or nothing but cereal for breakfast. Um, or a lot of people just have, you know, coffee with sugar and a donut. I mean, that's kind of obvious that that's bad. But most people think, oh, I had a bagel and I, and I put low-fat cream cheese on it, so it's okay. You know, but they're still spiking their blood sugar. Now, your body, again, has a natural ability to try to fix that. So it wants your blood sugar within a certain range, and it's going to yank it back down again through insulin production. So it pulls it back down. And then what happens, the low point is pretty much when 
then you are um, about generally 90 minutes to two hours later. And all of a sudden, you're hungry and grumpy and tired and you can't figure out why. Well, that's what's happening is your blood sugar just went down through the bottom of the optimal range. And now your body says, oh my goodness, I need food. And people think that hunger comes from an empty stomach. Hunger comes from your brain saying, oh my gosh, we need some sugar here. And But the typical response is you're, you're, you're just desperate. So you go and you get a Coke or your donuts, or you get something that's high, even pasta or something like that, and then you rock your blood sugar back up again. Okay, so we do this process over and over again, our lives typically. You know, until you're educated on what to do properly, this is the process that we do. Okay, now I promised only one more one graph, and this is the last graph. But I'm going to stick on this for a minute or two because this is the key to my entire presentation. If you can understand what happens in this graph, it, it'll be life changing uh, because. These children are are kind of riding a very dangerous path, and they don't know it. Okay, so what happens is your body, the green line is your is your insulin production. Okay, and what happens is if you ride that previous slide that I just showed you, where all of a sudden you're rocketing your blood sugar up and then driving it back down, and you're you're going through the norm and then you're going down through the bottom too much. Okay, what happens is again your body wants to remain in a nice blood sugar range, so it's going to do whatever it can, and it's going to continue to produce insulin, all right? Um, so and it produces insulin perfectly fine. And matter of fact, you're, what's happening is over time, as you're abusing your body, uh, eating wrong foods, then your insulin resistance is going up. So your really, insulin resistance goes up, but your body says, no problem, I can handle My pancreas will just pump out more insulin. And as long as those two lines, as long as the orange and the green are parallel, there's no issues. And this is my message to you. If you get nothing else out of this, this, this is the message. This process right here can take two years or it can take 20 years, but eventually your insulin resistance is going to keep rising and your insulin production won't be able to keep up. This is not type 1 diabetes. This is type 2. You've exhausted your pancreas and exceeded its ability to produce enough insulin and it's going to drop off. Okay, when the insulin production suddenly drops off is when your blood sugar skyrockets. And then the doctor saying, I don't feel good. I'm getting all this central obesity. I'm getting very sluggish. I'm getting very foggy headed. And, and that's when they're going to say, oh, you're either pre diabetic or diabetic. But here's the issue the problem started five to 20 years before that. It just didn't show up yet because, again, your body's trying its best to keep up. So when you see your teenagers and they're on a horrible diet, but they're still Thin, they're still active. They're still focused. They're absolutely fine. They say, hey, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't have any symptoms whatsoever. Well, of course they don't have any symptoms because their body's doing everything it can to produce that insulin. And as it gets exhausted and drops off, then the symptoms come. People very often tell me, oh, yeah, well, I, I hit 30 or I hit 35 and, and my metabolism slowed down. And that's why I get weight around the middle. And that's why I got lazy. And that's why I got sluggish and lethargic and all that kind of stuff. It's not your meta it's really a misnomer. It's not your metabolism slowing down. It's your insulin resistance going up. And that happens. And again, you won't feel anything and there'll be no symptoms whatsoever. And that is the dangerous part about type two diabetes. And the reason why it's happening now in little kids is little kids are being fed a total garbage diet. Even the formulas that they're that they're taking and then they, they have this garbage diet. By the time they're seven years old, their insulin production can't put you know, can't deal with it and it crashes. And this is a sad state of affairs because it is reversible. All right. Part of the problem <laughs> is our stinking food pyramid that everyone thinks we should eat this way. It's just it's ridiculous. This this is the food pyramid. You know, six to eleven servings of bread, pasta, and rice every day. I mean, who, who the heck? I mean, <laughs> sorry, I, I get. I'm going to try and control my anger here. Um, you know, and then then some vegetables and fruits and things like that. Um, and then just a little bit of your meat, fish, beans, eggs, and nuts, and then almost no fat. And then, so in my opinion, this thing could almost be just, just completely it, could, it should be completely upside down. Fats are fantastic for you if they're the right kind of fats. We should be eating avocados and coconut oils and all kinds of good stuff, all right? Uh, you know, granted, you shouldn't eat a ton of soda fat, but, but it's not bad for you, okay? 
Uh, meats are not bad for you. But, and by the way, a saturated fat is simply a fat that's solid at room temperature. That's probably the easiest definition. So the marbling in a meat or the fact that butter stays um, solid at room temperature. Those, those are your saturated fats. But in small amounts, those are not bad for you. So don't avoid those. And do eat lots of the good fats. Do eat lots of fish and poultry and beans and things like that. There's nothing wrong with those, okay? What you should be minimizing are the glycemic foods, such as the breads, rices, and pastas. And I'm not telling you not to eat them. I'm just saying the pyramid should be reversed, okay? We'll get more into kind of the, the, the details of that. Um, but here's the good news, all right? Um, we're all like, oh, my goodness, what are, what are we going to do? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm gaining weight here. Uh, my, my blood sugar is on the rise. My doctor's telling me I've got syndrome X or I've got insulin resistance or whatever they want to call it. Um, the first good news is the process is reversible. I'm not allowed to claim healing and curing of disease or anything like that, but I can tell you that if you follow some pretty simple uh, procedures, the process is reversible as far as the blood sugar goes, and the good news is a lot of the, the, the side effect of that is weight loss. So we, we don't even target weight loss. We target blood sugar control, energy, clear-headedness, you know, just a, a general sense of well-being. And guess what? The, the great side effect of eating properly is the weight loss. So that's, that's, that's kind of a neat thing. It's a different way of looking at it instead of dieting. The thing is, with properly, if you're eating the, the correct way, you're not losing muscle and water, you're just losing insulin-resistant fat. And that's very, very important because, you know, I, you know, I tell people you can chop head off and you'll lose 10 pounds right away. It's exactly the healthy way to do it, though, right? That's a way to lose weight. Okay, so if you're losing the wrong stuff, I mean, your head would be quite an exaggeration. But, you know, muscle and water and that sort of thing, it's really not doing you any good, all right? Insulin-resistant fat is in your waist. And when I say it's in your waist, it's actually, it's not on the outside of your body. It's actually, it's interorgan. It's between the organs. There's fat layers that start to group. Um, you have these guys like to have a really big, you know, pendulous, large belly, but it's actually kind of hard. It's solid. Uh, it's not jiggly. It's because the, the fat is actually on the inside between the organs, and that's the most dangerous fat. That's the insulin-resistant fat that we're trying to get rid of, okay? So in your diet, Get the concept of that, that food pyramid that I just showed you that needs to be flipped on its butt. Fat is not the enemy, okay? The low-fat diet is what really killed America, frankly. You know, back in the, in the 70s or so, they said, oh, no, we've got to have a low-fat diet. Well, a gram of fat has a tremendous amount of calories in it. So if you take a, you know, a few grams of fat, you have to add a, lots of grams of carbohydrates to get the same amount of energy production, the same calories. So all of a sudden, yeah, we got on a low-fat diet, but we quadrupled the amount of, of um, carbs that we're eating, and that's wrong. If you look at, you know, go to, go to Italy and eat a meal, and pasta is in a little tiny bowl on the side. It's cooked al dente style, and it's, and it's small. Right? It's not the underpinnings of your meal like we do <laughs> Here, when you cook it, you get pot. It's in a huge bowl, and the meat's laying on top of it. That's that's not the proper way to eat, uh, as as far as uh, carbohydrates. Okay. So let's get into just um, kind of the fun and practical things that that we can do. All right. Uh, first thing is, you should really eat often, and at least five, if not seven times a day. Now these are seven big meals or five big meals, but eating often means even a handful of almonds, just to make sure that fuel is coming into your body. Again, your body knows how to regulate itself. So when your body sees uh, calories coming in, it says, okay, we're not starving. We're okay here. <laughs> as soon as your body thinks it's starving, because people, the, the first thing people do is they skip breakfast. And the guy don't have time. I wasn't really hungry when I woke up, so they skip breakfast. Well, that means your body hasn't seen food since dinner the night before all the way to lunch the next day. That's a huge amount of hours. And your body says, Man, the food coming in here, and it starts. It gets into starvation mode, and it holds on to fat more. So you want to eat, and even a handful of almonds, you know, small amounts. It doesn't have to be large. Okay, always eat a low glycemic breakfast. Make sure you do not skip breakfast. Uh, it's the most vital meal because you're immediately setting your blood sugar properly. So you're going to set your calorie intake for the rest of the day. And there's way of eating a healthy breakfast. I do a, a shake, obviously. Um, we have. Um, you do uh, steel cut oatmeal. There's different ways of getting proper carbs and things and stuff. We'll chat on that in a minute. But don't skip breakfast. People skip breakfast thinking they're doing themselves a favor. It's the worst thing you can do. There's a study out there when kids eat a high glycemic breakfast. You know, you feed them nothing but cereal or bagel or toast and juice or something like that. They'll consume 
80% more calories every day. Which, so they're almost doubling their caloric intake because you set them up wrong. And if you remember back a few slides, that, that first curve where I showed that your, your blood sugar skyrocketing, that's exactly what's happening. They get, they're just, they should be hungry 90 minutes later. So they eat more and they, rock, they just rock and roll their pancreas all day long and 80% more calories. They're almost doubling the caloric intake. So you can imagine what that does to the obesity rate. Um, now, we want you to eat low glycemic, but not low carb. I'm not recommending an Atkins style of diet. I'm recommending that you look at the glycemic index and learn about this. And we could probably do a whole talk on glycemic index versus glycemic load, all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is it's it's a matter of how quickly it's going to um, spike your blood sugar, really is what it is, how, how quickly it turns to sugar. Um, so, you, wanna, you know, for instance, um, Table sugar is a carb, but broccoli is also a carb. You know, you can eat broccoli, and that's not eating low carb. You can eat a bowl of broccoli. That's not eating low carb, but that's eating very low glycemic. Again, we'll get into a little bit more of this in just a minute. Try to balance your food also with protein. It really helps. If you're going to have some carbs, have some proteins, it slows down the burning of the carbohydrates. That's one way. And then also add healthy fat. As well. Healthy fats will slow down the burning. Uh, I wrote down carabas here. That's a, uh, for, I don't, know, I don't know who's in the area that's on the webcast and who's not, but carabas is a great Italian restaurant. I absolutely love it. But the first thing they put in front of you is this beautiful, warm, nicely baked bread um, and some olive oil with some spices in it. And people go, oh, that, the olive oil, that's fat. I won't have that. I'll just have a few slices of this bread. And they end up eating the whole loaf typically, you know, whatever. Um, so the idea, though, is you, if you want to have the bread, you should dip it in the olive oil. Olive oil is actually, it's a, first of all, it's a good fat, not a bad fat, especially extra virgin olive oil. But it's a good fat, not a bad fat. And it slows down the burning of the bread. So the bread actually becomes lower glycemic. I can mean you eat the whole loaf of bread. Have some of it, enjoy it, and use that olive oil. Um, as a as a flavoring, um, here's some things that that are kind of that are mind blowing to me. Um, and this is where you need to learn what glycemic index is. There's glycemic index. You just Google glycemic index, and you'll find charts and charts. Uh, you can go onto my um, my blog. There's a there's a list of some uh, low glycemic foods and things like that. But for instance, as an example, pretzels have the same glycemic index as jelly beans. So sometimes people are like, well, I'm trying to eat well. I don't want to eat a lot of fats and stuff like that. And they'll sit down at a, you know, um, watching TV or something like that, and they'll eat a whole bowl or a whole bag of pretzels, right? Now you, but they wouldn't think of eating a whole bowl or a whole bag of jelly beans. They'd be like, oh, no, that's stupid. I'm on a diet. I can't do that. But they would eat pretzels. They're the same. <laughs> people don't realize that. And what I mean by they're the same is actually the same effect on your blood sugar. And the entire weight loss, the entire uh, management of, of blood sugar, even the effects on cholesterol and things like that, it's affected by blood sugar anyway. So it's, it's identical to your body. Your body doesn't know the difference between a jelly bean and a pretzel. Just keep that in mind. Uh, rice cakes. Oh, my gosh. We used to feed our kids rice cakes all the time when they were babies, and I thought that was great for them because it was just plain old rice, nothing else, nothing, you know, nothing, nothing fake, blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out rice cakes are extremely glycemic. It's basically like putting table sugar on your tongue when you eat rice cakes. So um, probably a good plan to do that. Uh, another one, corn flakes and frosted flakes, they're basically the same. It's like corns have the sugar hidden on the inside and frosted flakes just put it on the outside. But they really are the same as far as when you look at these uh, on the glycemic index, that they're almost identical. Frosted flakes are, are a hair higher, but they're almost identical. So so don't think, oh, I'm eating special care, I'm having corn flakes, that's better for me. It's not. As long as it's processed like that, most likely it's going to be a high glycemic food. Um, the things you, you can do, you can make adjustments. Um, if you're going to have oatmeal, oatmeal is very, very good for you. If it's steel-cut oatmeal, now granted, steel-cut oatmeal takes 30 minutes to cook. So it's the kind of thing where you have to put, it, you have to put some thought into it uh, and think ahead. So want to um, put it on the stove, you know, get a shower or something like that, come down ready. In oatmeal, yeah, it takes five minutes. That's awesome. You can do it in the microwave really quickly, but it's about six times the glycemic index of the steel-cut. And then if you do slow cook, like the 10-minute ones or the 15-minute ones, they're kind of in between. So the more you can go towards the actual grain, the better off you're going to be. Um, fruit juice. I, personally, I just avoid all juices altogether. I would just say go for water. Uh, I really think water is just the best way to go. If you're going to have anything due to a fruit or excuse me, a fruit drink. A fruit drink is just soda without the fizz. It's, there's nothing different. It's all fake. If it says for fruit juice, if it's 100% fruit juice, dilute it a lot. 
at least 50 percent, if not more. Um, you know, we would we would just sort of splash a little bit of apple juice and a big thing of water and just flavor it slightly or something like that. Um, you really don't. And, and frankly, water. Thinking of water as fuel. Every time you drink a nice, just a, just a clean bottle or a clean glass of water, just think of it as fuel for your body. Uh, juices, we just frankly we don't need them. This, Again, you got white bread. You think, oh, it's really bad for me. I'll go for the wheat bread, the whole grain wheat bread, um, and you know the Petch Farm or whatever. As long as you can take the part of it, the middle part of it, and roll it in a ball, and you know, it, and it actually sticks in a ball like a snowball, and you can throw it at someone's head. Uh, if, if you can roll it in a ball and it stays that way, it's probably not good for you. It's probably high glycemic and very high in gluten and things like that. Um, so what you really want is sprouted grain breads if you're going to have breads. All right? uh, Ezekiel breads are good. Uh, there's, there's several. They're usually in the freezer section uh, because they're actual sprouted grains and there's not a lot of uh, preservatives in them and things like that. Uh, but you can feel the difference. You actually feel the um, energy and the, it's very much sustained energy from those type of breads. Potatoes, same thing. Instant mashed potatoes are like candy to your body. Regular mashed potatoes that you've actually baked and mashed up, again, it's getting a little bit better. Potato getting much better, but a baked sweet potato, not not a, not a candied yam with marshmallows and syrup. <laughs> that doesn't count. But a sweet potato um, is absolutely just a plain baked sweet potato, fantastic for you. Um, you can put a little organic agave on there if you want to and a little cinnamon or something if you want to. Really good, slow burning. You'll feel the sustained energy from it, um, and it's frankly just as simple to cook as mashed potatoes. Um, and then pastas. I, I mentioned this before. Cook them al dente. Cook them a little bit stiff, and that will lower the glycemic load. Use portion control. Uh, don't don't go having a whole bowl of pasta. Have a small portion of pasta. Cook them al dente, and then uh, don't reheat them. See if you if you cook them on the mushy side, you're about doubling the glycemic index. And then if you reheat it the next day, it goes up again. So if you think about it, the more you're processing it away from the original, in other words, the more times you cook it or the more times you process it, the worse it's going to be for you. So that's just a couple of kind of kind of helpful hints that kind of help me. I, I don't have time to talk about this stuff on, on this one because this is a very fast webcast, but there's things you can do like just portion size, uh, very, very simple portion size uh, hints that we can tell you. Uh, how to eat out at restaurants. There's some things you can do and, and not do. And, again, we could have a whole other a whole other talk on this one. Um, glycemic load versus index that very simply your glycemic index is kind of how fast it spikes your blood or how fast it turns to sugar um, but something could be very high glycemic in its index like a carrot but has no calories so the glycemic load even though it's turning fast there's not much there so it actually does not have a bad effect on you so you have to look at load as well um, our feeders don't even get me started <laughs> just avoid them please they've even ruined agave you know agave it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's from a cactus. It's very, very healthy for you. Now they're putting high fructose corn syrup in some of the agave. So when you look for agave, you have to look at thing. You make sure that it's um, organic raw agave, or else it's going to have nasty stuff in it. It's just, it's, it's wacky. MSG goes by so many names now. The best advice I can give you is, if you know, instead of learning how to read labels on food, don't eat food with labels. Get a label on it. It's probably bad for you. If it's down one of the central aisles of the store, it's probably bad for you. Shop the printer. Stay foods that you can actually recognize. That's going to help you a lot. Margarine is plastic. Avoid that. Um, so it's not just bad from the sugar. It's also bad from the phosphorus that they use to uh, carbonate it because phosphorus tends to leach calcium uh, from your bones. Very, very bad. People don't realize that. Um, and then there's another Big, 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 and please, please understand this. Get rid of the canola oils and all, all the different oils. If they're kind of a light-colored oil, they're in a light plastic container, just read them. If it says the word hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, the amount of actual oxidation, if you take a, a food and you fry it in a hydrogenated oil, the amount of oxidation is significantly, it's, it's actually the same as cigarette smoke. Now, most of us on the line here don't. If you do smoke, I mean, don't feel condemned. Um, but we can actually help you with that. <laughs> we can help you with that too. But smoking is kind of an obvious case of you're pouring oxidation into yourself. Well, when you eat a hydro, when you next time you go to eat a nugget or a fry, understand that they're about the same when it comes to um, your um, the it's going to have as far as oxidation on your body. So try to avoid those really, really strong. Water. How much water should you drink? It's real simple. Take your weight. Divide by two. 
If you weigh two pounds, drink 100 ounces. It's really simple, okay? Um, and water is key. Uh, if you do nothing else, if you don't exercise and you don't do make any other changes, just change the water take and see some weight loss right away. You'll see some better glycemic control right away just from the water. And no beer, wine, and coffee don't count because everyone cheats. <laughs> everyone says, well, I had three glasses of wine. That's a lot of liquid. I'm like, no, that's a diuretic. That does not count. In fact, it's the opposite. Okay, same with coffee. It doesn't count. And if you have a coffee, that's fine, but have another bottle of water. Add a bottle of water to, to what you're doing. Every time you have something like, like this, a diuretic, add water to it. Okay. Um, exercise, and I only have about a minute here, so I'm going to go fast, but exercise. Just slow. If you haven't done any exercise, just try walking. Maybe to walk three times a week. You can walk slow at first. That's fine. The hardest part of exercise is getting your sneakers on. You know, put them on and walk 15 minutes away from your house. You know, set a timer. When the 15 minutes rings, turn around and walk back. Um, and that's it. Do that a few times a week just to start. You'd be amazed at the, what these little tiny differences. Just drink some extra water, do a little bit of exercise. Um, we're not asking you to change your entire lifestyle here. We're asking you to make small changes that you can do. Alarm, and that's the difference. And keep it on. You know, we don't, as a kid, you run around the yard all, all day long and you're doing stuff and you're kicking a ball and everything else, but we call it recreation, so we do it all the time. And we call it exercise. So we're like, oh, I don't want to exercise. And we stop. So think of something fun that you can do with throwing a frisbee or running on a beach or swimming or whatever it is. If, it, if it's recreational, you'll do it more often. That's why I say these are simple things that you can do. Just be a kid again, all right? Uh, I'm going to uh, figure out if you're on the right track. This is, uh, and I think I'm just going to at a time. I'm going to close with this because um, I've got a bunch more slides on things like uh, um, collateral and stuff, and I don't want to depress you further. Uh, um, am I myself? That's a good question. Um, my, I would say no, and I would say the most important measurement uh, that that can determine kind of your di risk of all diseases across the board is your measurement at your waistline. So you're basically measure your waistline right at your belly button and and see what that is. And the ideal goal is it should be less than half your height. So if you're 60 inches tall, you should have a 30-inch waist. If you're 70 inches tall, you should have a 35-inch waist, etc. If it's less than half your height, you're probably in good shape. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying don't go get your physicals and all that, but you're probably in pretty darn good shape, blood sugar-wise and everything else, because typically speaking, if you're type two, if you're leaning towards type two, you'll get some central weight gain. So that'll be your indicator. So kind of go by what, how your pants fit, kind of go by what that, that measurement is instead of weighing yourself. Um, so here's some examples for you. Um, so the, the exception to that is I, I tell people, especially when you're trying to lose weight, unless, you know, if you're doing a contest or something, go ahead and weigh yourself. Whatever. But in general, it can, it, you, you weigh to fluctuate weight depending on the time of day, depending on the humidity, you know, all, all kinds of stuff, what you ate the night before or whatever. Um, but so don't necessarily track your weight. Don't necessarily weigh yourself while you're dieting to get down to a certain weight. But once you are down to where you feel comfortable and you're happy, you probably should about one a week, measure yourself to make sure you're not creeping up again, because that's, when we, that's where we lose the battle. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, well, I, I think I'm okay still, and then we creep, 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 and then we're back up, you know, 20 pounds, and then we get to, we get distressed about it. So we don't we don't want that to happen. I, I recommend on the way down, don't don't weigh yourself. But then once you're at your goal, you, your your waistline is good, everything's happy or whatever. Yeah, it's probably a good idea maybe once a, once a week or so to, to go ahead and weigh yourself in there. Um, and no cheating. What I mean by no cheating. Is it says weigh your it says measure your waistline at your belly button, and we all know men that just keep wearing their pants lower and lower and lower, and it's like I'm plus size 32, but your pants are dragging on the ground. That's that doesn't count. So you have to make sure your measurement is actually at the belly button, All right? Um, and I think what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save um, the rest of this talk because uh, there's some other topics I really want to talk about. I want to talk about why supplements play a part when you're losing weight and, and how they help your body to detox. I want to talk about some of the myths of cholesterol, good and bad cholesterol, what makes it good, what makes it bad, what does cholesterol do for you in reality, talk a little bit about statin drugs and some of the things we can do for that, uh, and then kind of go through. Um, and we probably have several other topics that we can cover. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to end it there. And um, I thank you guys for your patience. I went on, eh, I'm, I'm right about 30 minutes. So I'm pretty good. Um, but I want to thank you guys for, for being on the line. And um, I'm going to see if I can get to my uh, last slide. Um, but if you have questions or whatever, you can feel free to contact me directly. Uh, my email address is also on the screen. We also have a system where you can go ahead and take an online health assessment. Uh, feel free to do that. I've got a link there, health.davidelevania.com. Um, by the way, just go to www 
DavidDelevany.com. It's going to take you to my blog, and there's some good articles there also on how to choose uh, low glycemic foods, and you'll you'll be able to find your way around on that, uh, no problem. Uh, but we want to thank you for being on. And uh, Nick, if you have anything else to add, uh, um, I'm pretty much I'm pretty well done. I will give you the obligatory disclaimer that the statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. The products mentioned there are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. We have no questions in the queue, but we do have this recorded, so we will be able to, to post later for those who couldn't make it tonight. Ah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on, and we will see you next week.